look at Romans chapter 8. <coughs> Romans chapter 8, look at verse uh, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to what? The will of God. Now, I know the will, the will of is here in italics, so you can take it out, but it's still the same. According to God, according to what he uh, knows and what he's going to, uh, uh, to do. Verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. I, and on that verse there, one of the things that I was going to point out in all things work together for good uh, to them that love God, I liken it to a, uh, a recipe for cakes or cookies. How many of you have, <laughs> might, be a, might be a silly question, but how many of you have, had, uh, have tasted cake? Or cookies, okay? Have you ever tasted some that you really like? Okay. Have you ever taken the recipe and taken all of the ingredients of that cake or cookie and uh, set separated them? You know, you, when you're going to make the cake, you get all the ingredients together and you mix them all together and then you cook it. Have you ever taken it all apart? Not taken it apart, but get all the ingredients ready and then taste each individual. Anybody ever done that? How many of you ever tasted flour? Just plain flour. Okay. Sugar's not bad. Okay. When you put a little sugar in your mouth. Uh, how about baking powder? How many of you like to uh, mix up an egg and taste the egg? <laughs> each thing individually might not be so bad, but all working together and then baked works together for good, right? So every individual thing in our life might not seem great, might not seem uh, real bad, but whatever it is, together with everything else, all things work together for good. And so we've got to keep that in mind. We go through a time. Now, I remember when I uh, first started, well, been off and on since the church started, but I think it was maybe two years after the church began, I was able to quit my uh, secular job over in Morgan Hill and go full time just to, uh, for the church. The first day, I, I, I think we take, took a vacation, but the first day I was, I was full time, I stepped on a nail. <laughs> and <laughs> just for the whole week, I was miserable because of that nail that got stuck. I, I got it out. I didn't leave it in there. But uh, just things happen, and we need to recognize that that might not be good in itself, but working together as God directs all the events in our lives, uh, it works together for good. Uh, go over to Acts chapter 4. Well, uh, before we go there, I want you to see again Phil Philippians uh, chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, look at verse number 6. He says, be careful, or don't worry about, be careful for nothing, don't worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Don't forget prayer. Supplication and prayer are talking to God, but always looking to Him, saying, I know that all things work together for good, so, Lord, as I pray and seek your help in this situation, I'm going to thank you now because I know it's going to work out along with everything else for my good. And when we do that, is what he's saying there in verse 26. And he goes on to verse 27. I'm sorry, 6 and 7. And the peace and 
Okay? That word and it brings it together. As we do this, the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Okay? The peace of God. And we need to keep that in mind. And God, as we trust God, as we recognize His sovereignty, recognize that we're going to go into looking at His love toward us. Uh, we need to recognize He is always watching out for us. He's always working in our lives no matter what. Look at, uh, and also it's our responsibility to pray. See, if we, do, if we stop and, and we don't think about praying, think about seeking God's help in a situation, we tend to forget He's even around. And so we always need to re remember to pray, to talk with Him, because He's the one that's going to give you peace. Okay, go over to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, and look, first of all, at verse number 24. Well, let's go to 23. And being let go, that's uh, Peter and John, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, that's they is, is the, the church, the people that they went back with, Christians. When they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. What does it mean, one accord? Together, with the same heart, the same desires, okay? One accord. And said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Now, now jump down to verse 27. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, now you ever think about that, what he said, they did what you have determined ahead of time to happen. They followed, they, they, uh, <coughs> I'm missing the words. They 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 just fell into the the track that God had laid out, and they did what God planned for them to do. Verse twenty nine. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. They knew that God was in control. They recognized that Pontius Pilate and and uh, Herod and all the, the the Romans, all that what happened to Jesus was all foreordained of God. And now, and because they know He's in control, now they say, "Look what's happening, Lord. We need Your help and Your guidance, even though what is happening is according to Your will." That's it's kind of strange to think about that. Why? Well, if everything is going to happen according to God's will, why do I need to pray? Anybody have it to think about why? Why should we pray? If, he, if he's al already got everything going the way he wants, why in the world should we pray? Okay, no, it helps us. What's another reason? Jose? It's designed to, to ask our, right? like, is that way he's going to help us? Yeah, he, he tells us to. And he's going to help us because we pray. It's not going to not necessarily going to change things, but because his what he has planned is going to happen. Now we can mess things up. Uh, I mean, not for him. <laughs> He's always he always can fix everything, um, but he tells us to pray with prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known unto God. He says. Go over to, I want you to see something. Now, maybe you've seen this. Maybe I've shown it to you before. But I want you to go back to the book of Ezra. Ezra. Now, Ezra and uh, Nehemiah were both um, 
books that were uh, about the time after the Babylonian captivity, and Ezra was was uh, was the first one, not not Ezra himself, but Zerubbabel and uh, many of the people who were from Israel or Israelites who were in Babylon in the Babylonian captivity. Uh, Multitudes of them came back to, to Israel to rebuild the temple, rebuild the city. And Ezra was the, in, in this book, and the people of this time were first, and then Nehemiah came. But both of these people, Ezra and Nehemiah, knew uh, that they are to turn to the Lord. Now look at Ezra chapter 8, and I want to start at verse 21. <laughs> Then I proclaimed a fast there. Now this is Ezra. I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. What's he saying? We stopped here and we needed to pray to the Lord. Now look at verse 22. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. It means he, he helped them, and they didn't have trouble as they went on uh, to Israel. He bragged about God. He bragged to the king about, about his God. God is with us, and he's going to help us. Well, now am I going to ask the king, when he, maybe, maybe he saw something ahead, that there's, there's wicked people out there who are going to try to stop us, and maybe steal all the goods that we're taking back to Israel. Uh, we need protection. You know, that, and that brings us to the, the thought of fear. I know I've, all, I've said about fear. Fear is the absence of faith. Well, God has given us the ability or the, the emotion of fear. And, but the, the thing about having fear is, yes, we can be afraid. And, and I believe Ezra was afraid here to a certain extent. But he turned to the Lord. He stopped them and said, look, even if, even if things are terrible down there, and there's going to be enemies, there's going to be thieves and robbers, and they're going to want to attack us, um, he, said, he says, I'm turning to the Lord, and I'm going to trust in Him. And that's what, what Paul was telling us, uh, with prayer and supplication, with what? Thanksgiving. That means I'm resting in the Lord. I'm not having to have fear anymore. So we can be afraid, but don't let that tear us down because if we let the fear tear us down then we're saying or thinking or not thinking about God and his care for us and we're going to we're going to we're going to be in pain emotional pain because we are not trusting God and so yes fear is one thing but when we allow that fear to overtake us that's when it becomes sin because we need to turn to the Lord. And that's what Ezra does here. And we'll see uh, Nehemiah does uh, the same thing in a different way as we go on. So we want to look now, okay, God is sovereign. And so the adversity that comes in our lives, we need to recognize God is still here. God is in control in all my life. He's, he's never leaving me. Jesus said, I'm going to send you another comforter. Now, we're going to read it in a little bit, but let's just, let, me, let me point out uh, that I say a little bit. It might be next week. Uh, but um, Jesus said, I'm going to send another comforter. And we know that that's the Holy Spirit. But remember, he says, another comforter. Okay, who was the first? Jesus. He, he was there. He was comforting them. He was giving them advice and telling them what they need to know and what they need to do. And he was helping them to work on their minds. Okay? He's leaving, and so he tells them, when I leave, I'm, if, if I don't go, he's not going to come. So I have to leave. I'm going to send the comforter. But he also, as in that, in that 
conversation as he's talking to them, he says, I will come to you. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit. Yeah, the Comforter is Christ's Spirit. Not His body that they can see. It's the Spirit that they need to realize He is with us. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Jesus, God said that years ago to Joshua and Moses. And uh, uh, so God is sovereign. He's always with us. Well, we want to look now at God's love. Uh, God's love in adversity. We've got to keep in mind, it's not just about God being in control, but God is in control and He recognizes you as His child. And He loves His children. Look over at Romans chapter 8 again. How many of you have ever seen, I mean, seen? <laughs> Be careful when you answer. How many of you have ever seen God's love? What? What's that, Jerry? We've seen the evidence. It's like seeing the wind. Nobody has ever seen the wind. Oh, you might see, see dust flying in the wind, but you haven't seen the wind. And you can't see God's love. You can see evidence of His love. And you can read about His love. But love itself. How, how many of you have ever seen your wife's or your husband's love? Now we can see the results. We can see that they do love us because of how they treat it. <laughs> Should be. But, uh, but loving... Look what what Paul says about God's love. Look at verse number 38. For I am persuaded. What does persuade mean? What, if he says, I'm persuaded, does that mean somebody convinced him? We're convinced. But what, is it, what does it mean, convinced? He believes. It's, it's solid in him. I'm persuaded, I'm convinced of this true fact, okay? I am persuaded that neither... Now, here's that word like uh, both. I just mentioned it last week. We talk about both. In our language today, we're thinking of two things when you talk about both. But biblically, when you look at both or even neither, uh, it's talking ne not necessarily just about two things. It's talking about several things. He says, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, when you look at, you look at this passage, these two verses, Paul's saying, none of these things. And he, he gives this list, but, but he also adds to it, nor any other creature. Now remember the word creature. He said, other creature, which one of these things that he talks about, uh, aside from angels, which one of those things are creatures? All right, one? Well, principalities. But all of them are. He said, well, what? What do you mean all of them are? Which one of them was not created? Okay? None of them were not created. All of them have been created by God. Death? Well, death came because of, uh, because of what of Adam's sin. But God said, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So death was actually God's doing. Um, or life. God created life. God created the angels. God created the principalities and powers, the, the ruling forces. Um, the, things that are, the things that are present are created. Things to come are created. Height and depth, any other creation. Okay? Even though God has created all of these things, He's saying nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now, 
step out of our Christianity for a second, don't really, but just step out and think from outside looking in and reading this. You cannot stop here. When you read this, uh, shall be able to separate us from the love of God. You can't stop at that comma. Okay, some people might read it and say nothing can separate us from the love of God. But something can if we're not in Christ. Now, God loves everybody. God loves every human being that has ever lived. But sin will separate us from God. And even though God loves, He continues to love even when He sends people to the lake of fire. Uh, we'll, we'll see how in God's love that kind of thing is hurts God. God does not... The uh, Bible tells us that God is not... Um, well, how does it put it? He, he, he's not happy at the death of the wicked. Put it that way. God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. Okay, he, he, he has to do it. But his love goes beyond what we look at. His love is, is greater than we can understand. And so the love of God here, because we are in Christ Jesus, nothing can ever separate us from God. He loves, and He'll continue to love, and He'll hold on to us. Nothing can take us out of his, our Father's hand. And so, God's love, uh, is we've got to keep that in mind as we go through adversity, as we go through difficulties. God still loves us, and He knows what is happening to us. It's natural for us when we go through a, a difficult time to even ask questions. Why is this happening to me? Have you ever thought about this? I know th there, are, there are people outside of Christ, and they go through a difficult time, and they'll say questions like, why is this happening to me? Now, wait a minute. If, uh, p even people who don't believe in God, they'll, they'll ask that question. Why is this happening? To me, it's, it's like saying there is a God. Mm -hmm. There is another power outside of me and this world that is in control. And, you know, people can, can call it fate. They can call it, uh, well, fate, basically, is all I can think of. It's just going to happen. Whatever is going to happen to you is going to happen to you. But then why? There is a power. And so when we go through difficulty. We need to recognize that that power is God. And even though we might have questions, uh, we need to recognize He is always there. I want you to see what uh, the psalmist said. Go over to Psalm 31. David is called the sweet psalmist of Israel. Uh, he, he wrote many of the psalms, songs that uh, Israel sang. But in Psalm 31, look at what he says in verse number 22. He says, For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. Who's he talking to? Probably talking to the Lord. And, and he says, I said this in my haste. Now the word haste, we, we normally think of it as being in a hurry. I said it quickly and I shouldn't have, basically. The word haste here can mean uh, alarmed. I said because it, it shook me because I had this trouble and it caught me by surprise, in a sense. I said in my haste, um, I'm cut off before thine eyes. Because it caught me by surprise, I didn't think you saw. I didn't think you were there to recognize that I was in difficulty. 
in my haste. Don't, when, when we are alarmed at a difficulty, don't think God isn't watching. Don't think God is not understanding. See, he said, he's, he came to the right conclusion. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplication. When, I, when, I, when it hit me, I forgot you're still watching. But by the time I got settled down, I remembered. And so I called out to you, Lord, and you heard me when I cried. God hears. God hears, and God is always watching. God is never uh, caught off guard like we are. And so he cried out, Ezra cried out to God, and God never forgets. I'm not going to take you here, but Isaiah 49, we've read it about uh, what several times in the past <laughs> years, when God says, can a woman forget her uh, nursing child? He says, they might forget, but I won't forget you. I mean, that's a very close relationship, a woman with her baby and uh, taking care of her baby. And he says, they, they, basically, they don't usually forget about their baby. How many of you have ever been left behind uh, when your parents took you someplace and you, they drove away and forgot you weren't with them? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> uh, my brother was left behind. Your brother. <laughs> uh, I, you know, you've, you've probably been lost at some time, and you thought that they, they left. Uh, I, I always go back to the San Diego Zoo. I don't go back there, but I, I think about it. And I, I stepped away from my parents. I had to go to the restroom, and I came back, and they weren't where I left them. And I didn't know where they went. And so I ended up walking out of the park, the zoo, going to... I knew where the car was. So I sat down on the berm in front of the car and cried. But <laughs> my wife says... Wow, I like seeing him cry. No, I. My parents didn't leave me though. <laughs> so a, a mother with a, a nursing child usually does not forget that child. But God said they may forget. Why? Why? Why might they forget? They're human. God's not human. God is God, and He'll never ever forget and so we've got to keep that he loves us and he's not going to uh, leave us or forget us I want you to go to Lamentations 3 and again we, we uh, are familiar I've read it just recently in the last couple of weeks Lamentations 3 and uh, start at verse number 18 and I said my strength is and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. Now, he's saying, look, I have, I have this trouble, I have this difficulty. This book of Lamentation is all about uh, Israel and how they turned away from God and how God had to bring judgment. So in this judgment, I'm basically, he says, I'm miserable. I'm, my, my life is full of wormwood and gall. And then he says this in verse 21. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Now he's not, not saying what I just told us. I'm not remembering these things so I have hope. No, it's what I'm going to tell you is what I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. And then he calls out to God, Great is thy faithfulness. The compassion of God watching over us. Yes, I had trouble. He's, and, and, and Jeremiah is telling us, There's very much trouble in my life. My strength and my hope is perished. But I remember that God loves me. He is very compassionate. Every morning it's like it's a fresh... Uh, uh, we think of a fresh new day in the spring with the rain. No, we, we look at a new day and, it's, and it, it's like, wow, we can start over again. God's compassions, it's like it's new every morning. There's no difference. He doesn't lose any. He's always compassionate. He's always loved, loving. When God gives his love to you, how much is taken away from somebody else? 
None, right? Can he love me as much as he loves Romero? If he loves, starts loving me more, can he still have enough love to give to Romero? That's right. Love is that strange thing that you can give it out and give it out and give it out, and you never lose it. You always have more you can give. And God has an infinite amount that he continues to give. Hang on to Lamentations 3. I'm going to come back there to some other verses. But go over to Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, and look at verse number 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. You know, we, we even, I think we mentioned it, sometimes adversity, sometimes troubles that we go through uh, are, are, are times that God brings to us for us to grow and get strengthened, grow spiritually, grow emotionally, uh, knowing uh, he's in control and getting closer to him. Sometimes he brings adversity because we've been bad. We've done things against him, and he has to bring chastening. So he says, despise not the chastening of the Lord. Why? Verse 12, for whom the Lord, what? Loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. So God sometimes has to bring chastening or correction. Again, he says, don't despise that. Don't be upset at it. It is still part of that cake. It's an ingredient to that cake. God's chastening uh, might taste like flour or baking powder, but put together with everything else is for our good. Look at, go back to Lamentations 3. And look at verse number 32. But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion, according to the multitude of what? His mercies. And you know what mercy is, right? Just in case. Mercy is God holding back punishment that is due. Now, we get, sometimes people can get grace and mercy mixed up. Grace means he's giving you something good that you do not deserve and is free. Okay? Mercy is holding back punishment or correction even though you deserve it. So he says, though he caused grief, he has compassion according to his mercy. Verse 33, For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. You know what that tells me? He doesn't like it when he has to do it. Mommy and Daddy always said, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. <laughs> But that's true when it comes to God. He doesn't do it. Will he, he, he has to do it. He has to bring it when it's necessary. So you think, well, wait a minute. How can, he, how can we say he doesn't do it willingly? Now he, it, it's a, it doesn't, he doesn't like it. He doesn't want to, but it's his justice that says, I have to do this for you, for your good, and for you to grow uh, knowing who I am, knowing that I'm in control and that I love you. Despise not the chastening of the Lord. Go over to Hebrews chapter 4. And look at verse number 16. Let us therefore come boldly. Now, boldly is not meaning uh, with a, 
an attitude or a proud attitude. I mean, it, it's saying basically, don't be afraid to come. Okay, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace. That means come to God in prayer, talking with Him, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Again, it's a it's a prayerful attitude, looking to the Lord and seeking His guidance and 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 His his understanding as we go through the trouble, as we go through the adversity, knowing He is still uh, loving us. Psalm 31, 19 says this, Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. God is good. And that the words he says, which thou hast laid up for them, it's like it's like he's got all of this goodness in reserve. That when when you need it, here it is. Here's what you need at the time. At the time you need it. And that's what that's the, the peace of God in time of need. What, the peace that passes all understanding. Now, how many of us have have go through our day and, and we just have peace that you can't understand? We have peace, but there's some times when you think, I don't know how I'm going to be able to handle this situation. And, and God, though, when we turn to Him, if, even if we don't understand how we're going to handle the situation, we go through it and we think, why was I so fearful or wondering? Because God gives us the peace that passes our understanding. And so he says he has goodness and this peace that he reaches out and gives to you. Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So we need to know God's word and hide it in our hearts. God stores up his goodness and applies it to our lives when we need it. Go over to 2 Corinthians. Familiar passage. At least, you might not know, if I tell you 2, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, you might not know what it says until you read it, then you're familiar with it. <laughs> you see you're familiar with it. Verse number 9, And he said unto me, this is Christ, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Paul says, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What does it mean, sufficient? Enough. My grace is enough for you. <laughs> We might think, oh, I need more, I need more. I, uh, no, God says, listen, I give you just enough. It might, it, it, when I, that sounds that sound like he's holding back some. I'm giving you just enough. I'm giving you sufficient. You ever sit at a, at a, a dinner, and you, you the, the, the dinner tastes so good, you want more and more and more. But we're supposed to do what? Eat what is sufficient for you. Uh, enough that you, you don't need any more. And that's what God says. My grace is, my grace can be overboard, can be much more than you need, but I give you what you need, and that's sufficient. That's enough. My grace is sufficient for thee. So when God brings adversity, God brings grief in our lives, that's when we can be strong because we're resting in Him, depending on Him. His grace is sufficient. And God gives us His goodness, His grace, because He is always with us. Go over to John chapter 15. And this is what I pointed out earlier, and I said we were going to look at it. Jesus tells the, um, did I say 15? 14. Verse 15. This is when Jesus tells them that the Comforter is coming. He says in verse 15, If ye love me, 
keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father. What, what does pray mean? Ask. ask. Don't forget that. It means ask, okay? And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. How long is that? <laughs> okay. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Now, yeah, you, you think about that. Have you ever seen the Holy Spirit? The Spirit of truth? No. But he says here, um, the world can't receive because it seeth him not. Well, since you haven't seen him, can you receive him? Who knows the answer? The answer is yes, you can. Why? Because you, you see him by faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we know that the Holy Spirit has come, and God Christ says He's coming to be in you and with you. So the world can't, they can't see Him by faith. Neither knoweth Him, but ye know Him, for He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. There it is. He is coming. He came to you. You have. That's why we can say Christ is in you. Because the Holy Spirit is in you. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in. You know, we, we've. I grew up hearing this, and um, people say, you need to ask Jesus into your heart. Where in the Bible does it say that? Nowhere is exactly. He comes in when we put our faith in Him. We don't have to ask Him to come in. He automatically does it because we have faith and believe that He died and paid our penalty of sin. And here, the Holy Spirit comes in. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The Holy Spirit is Christ in us. And uh, we need to recognize that and remember that. Um, let's just finish here and go to go to Isaiah 41. One verse to, to finish out today. We'll continue on next week. If the Lord does, uh, how do they say it? If the Lord tarries, uh, we'll be here next week. But if he doesn't tarry and he comes between now and then, I'll meet you up there, okay? <laughs> Isaiah 41, verse number 13. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. I will hold your hand. I have to, I have to tell you something, and I, I don't want to embarrass anybody. But um, I, I, maybe I'll just, I rode with somebody to uh, take their son to school years ago. You know, sometimes we, we men uh, are so what they call macho or tough, or you try to act like it. Well, I saw this guy care, walk his son across the street holding his hand. And I thought that was so cool. Because so many men say, oh, you don't need to hold my hand. When I'm you just make sure you do it. No, hold his hand. God holds our hand. I will hold you by your right hand. Why, why does he say our right hand? What does, that, what does that mean? If he's holding us by our right hand, which of his hands is holding us? Usually. What? The left hand. Okay, but why does he say, I, I will hold you by your right hand? It's a, it's a picture of his power. His, 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 his power, but it's, it's also giving us an understanding of, about us, too. One? Jesus is at, the right hand, so. Jesus is at, at his right hand, so it, it's taken. Now that's kind of what he's saying. But I, I see it in this way. He's holding you by your right hand because normally, even though some people are left-handed, 
that's your stronger hand. And you can hold on to him stronger. And you can keep looking to him that way. Now, if you were left-handed, he, he would tell you, I'll hold you by your left hand. But you just have to hang on with Jesus on, that, on his right hand. But God loves us. Always wants the best for us. And even though adversity comes, it's for our good. Because of his love for us, he's going to carry us through. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that even though adversity comes, trouble comes, whether it's grief or uh, difficulties in, in uh, life, in our jobs, our, our uh, um, relationships, Lord, we know that you love us and you're going to help us. And uh, Lord, as we continue to look to you, seek your guidance, pray and ask for your help, we know that you'll see us through and things will work out for good. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right.